Do you have a large outdoor space that you're trying to tame? Well, we have a game plan for you. I'm joined by Mandy Goldman from Yarrow Landscaping, and welcome back to Central Texas Gardener. Thank you. Great to have you here. Now, you know, um, people do sometimes face this dilemma of having big lots. Yes. Big open space, and it can be very daunting, right? Yes. For a homeowner, they look at that like, well, what the heck do I do? What's your best advice? Yeah, I definitely get a little bit of anxiety when I get those phone calls. They mm -hmm. get a nice, beautiful property, and they're like, I don't know what to do with this. Mm -hmm. This feels like impossible to tackle. So uh, the first piece of advice I would give someone uh, is to break it up into zones, sort of outdoor rooms and areas, mm -hmm. and define the priorities, what you want in each one of those spaces. Mm. And then... I start with the survey and I overlay a sheet of paper and I just make circles based on what a client's priorities are. Mm -hmm. So if they say, I want a pool, I want a children's garden, I want an herb garden, I want some lawn space, mm -hmm. I want some garden beds. We just put those in just a general format on a sketch. And then we start working with flow, going to and yeah, from the spaces. Right. It's so important, I think, that people break it down according to how they intend to use it. Exactly. No two gardens have to be alike, but it should reflect the way that you particularly interact with the outdoors. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah particularly if you have a big family and you want to entertain outside, then mm -hmm. plan for a space right off the patio with a nice outdoor dining mm -hmm. space. And then just break it down from there, working like, you know, little chunks at a time. Yeah. And also, in addition to the how you use it, is what you're willing to do to take care of it, right? Exactly. And one of the things that I always think of is that put the higher maintenance areas close in, close to water, et cetera, and then you can let things kind of bleed out and be a little more natural out on the edges. That's exactly how I think of it. Um, and I learned a lot of that from taking permaculture classes because mm -hmm. they taught you to think of things in zones where zone one is the circle tight around your house. Mm -hmm. And those are those high maintenance zones that you water more yeah, often. Right, yeah, right. And a lot of people think why we should put our vegetable garden far away because if I'm not maintaining it, it won't look good. Mm -hmm. But I tell them, th reverse that thinking. You're going to maintain it to make it look good if it's right by your house. Exactly. And if you, mm -hmm. let's say, are cooking in your kitchen in the morning and you're wearing slippers, you want to be able to just trot outside in your slippers and grab some vegetables and come back in. You don't mm -hmm. have to walk half a mile down your yard to go get some zucchinis <laughs> for your <laughs> breakfast potatoes. I don't know. Not in the Texas heat anyway. Yeah, not really. No. So, you know, when you mentioned creating flow in the garden, I want to explore that a little more fully because uh, it does mean maybe perhaps aligning with your work and all that kind of stuff. But it also means how you, uh, as you go through the garden, what the sequence of events is going to be, right? Exactly. Yes. If you want to think about who's using the space. If you um, have elderly parents who need a little bit easier access to an outdoor dining room, or you have children who are bolting out the door with the dogs and they want to get to their playscape, or you're just a, a couple at home that wants to get to their pool without touching the grass in the morning, mm -hmm. um, you definitely want to think about how you're going to integrate with your space and flow through it and make those areas connect in a sensible way. You have uh, a couple of examples I want to talk about. One is a large urban permaculture space. Yes. And tell me how, what the approach was and how you broke this space down to, to come up with the design. We've been working with this client for several years, mm -hmm. and um, I've had several of my designers working with her as well. And so she really clearly knew that she wanted to start a vegetable garden and beekeeping, was really excited about all these things. Oh, that's cool. So that helped us because our bells and whistles are going off. We're so excited. <laughs> We're like, yay, that's perfect. Yeah. So we had a list and we helped supplement the list with other things that she might not have thought about. Mm -hmm. So it was vegetable gardens, rain collection tanks, herb gardens, butterfly beds to... Uh, yeah. pollinating plants, right. things that help the bees. She wanted a pool, which is great because once you're working in the yard and you want to take a dip, that right. should be centrally located. And this yard was used previously as a, um, 
I think a mechanic yard or something. Wow. So there okay. was a lot of Big cleaning transition. up. <laughs> it, the before and after pictures are pretty great. And we're mm. not even done yet. This has been a several year project. Yeah. Thinking through all the connections really and how people use the space and all that. And you can, you know, as you think about that flow, you can create a sense of drama in the garden. You know, you can hide certain features that all of a sudden appear, or you can just direct people's eyes directly to something. Lots of cool ways Absolutely. to think about design. The other space that you, uh, we wanted to kind of share some of your thinking about mm -hmm. is a actually like an artist studio, correct? Yes. Yeah. It's actually located in Smithville. There's a nice lady out there, Judy Paul, who mm -hmm. started a mixed-use commercial space. She bought this old building that used to be a lumber yard. Mm. It has a lot of cool history and she's got a studio in there and she has art events. Cool. So she wanted it to feel like home but mm -hmm. still be a shared space that reflected their tastes and interests. Mm -hmm. We made a design to do a Xeriscape garden out front that would be low maintenance and maybe reflective of kind of a Marfa feel to it. Okay. And then in the inside of the fenced yard she wanted to do a little lap pool and some vertical wall space for showing their art. And Sounds great. So yeah, it has multiple functions. So we had to think a lot outside the box too because mm -hmm. we're trying to combine two different spaces into one. Well, but. and that's part of the idea here. When you create garden rooms, it's really just as you have an outside frame for the house. Exactly. The, the rooms inside define the uses and spaces and the interrelationships of the house. So Exactly, yes. Yeah. You referenced uh, your work with people who have, you know, uh, want to do vegetable gardening, beekeeping, that sort of thing. Let's talk about working with edibles. And, and you, you reference the fact that you believe they should be close to the house. Are there any other tips for people on that side? Uh, you definitely want to think about sunny locations. Um, some vegetables prefer some buffer against the western sun. Mm -hmm. Some fruit trees, fruiting species, need a southern exposure in the winter when the sun is lower in the southern sky. So right. you think about putting... I did, for one client, we espliate a peach tree on the back of their yard, I of love, their wall. I love espalier. Oh my plants. gosh, it was so beautiful. And it's finally starting to produce peaches this mm -hmm. year. So... Um, you can think about how to incorporate the edibles right up against the house and they mm -hmm. still have some function and beauty. And it's very easy for the kids and for everybody to go outside and pick their fruits and vegetables. Right. And integrate some herbs so that you have some evergreen anchor points. So you're not just yeah. having, that's what a lot of people are worried about is I'm going to put all these edibles and it's going to look really bad. It can't look like... Uh, as ornamental as other plants. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful gardens I've ever seen or vegetable or, or edible spaces. Yeah, uh, those you know. old English cottage gardens or with the chives. Or in the U.S., like, you know, in Mount Vernon, in Virginia, the uh, beautiful part of the garden is a kitchen garden. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, spreading the bounty uh, around for wildlife is another component piece that people should be thinking about. You mentioned pollinator gardens, but that's, that's something that a lot of people are really passionate about now. Yes, and if you have somebody in your family you're worried about who maybe has a bee allergy, um, you can push those back to the outer edges of the garden. They don't have to be right mm -hmm. up front. And I always encourage people with really large spaces to provide wildlife food at the edges of their spaces. Mm -hmm. Maybe create a living fence with uh, evergreen hedges that also mm -hmm. feed the wildlife. So yeah. you can definitely incorporate both into your garden space. Well, lots of great ideas here, Mandy. Uh, and your Yarrow Landscaping is based out of Smithville. Right? Uh, it's central Austin, okay. so yeah, we service everywhere. Okay. I particularly moved to Smithville because oh, okay. I needed the space, but yeah. So, well, Smithville's a, a great location. Austin, too, yes. as well. And Still it's love a, Austin. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to have you back on Central Thank Texas you. Gardener. Really good tips on tackling those great big expanses that a few people are lucky to still get. Absolutely, <laughs> right. yes. Got to wrap it up on that note, but thank you so much. Coming up next, it's Stephanie.